Excellent. All right. Welcome everyone. Uh, we'll give everyone a few minutes to file in and take their spot. As always, let us know where you're joining from. Um, obviously, I'm here and I'm Erin. I'm going to be your host tonight. Omar has been called away. Uh, I'm here in Connecticut, where we hope we're going to get through this next hour without losing the power. Uh, where are you all joining us from? Excellent. We've nearly, oh, and Mallory, our assistant curator, is joining us from the Twain House. I think we've hit every time zone in the continental US. Good work. Uh, Jennifer, who I know is a frequent guest joining us from not so snowy St. Paul. Well, we were very snowy today and probably in the next five hours, it will all be gone. Uh, we're getting a lot of rain. I think a lot of you are enjoying this rain with us. Excellent. All right, so. We will get started. Folks will filter in as we go. Um, welcome everyone. My name is Erin Bartram. I'm the Associate Director for Education here at the Mark Twain House. Well, not here at the Mark Twain House, but on behalf of the Mark Twain House. Um, I'm here with Marsha Zook. She has written an incredible book. Um, I have marked it up well and good. Um, and uh, most of you are pros. You've been to our, um, our author events before. Please remember uh, to use the Q&A function to ask questions as we go. I'll use that to draw from when we get to the open question period with Marsha, because I'm doing the hosting and the moderating. It'll be hard for me to catch comments and questions when you put them in the chat. So the Q&A is the best place uh, for me to find those things as we go along. Um, but I'll have a few extra questions. I know sometimes it takes us a bit to think of, of all the things we wanna say. Um, so Marsha Zook is a family law professor at the University of South Carolina School of Law. She's a graduate of Dartmouth and the Yale Law School. Her previous book, Buying a Bride, explored the history of mail order marriage in the United States. And she lives in Columbia, South Carolina. Um, and her book today, You'll Do, A History of Marrying for Reasons Other Than Love. Um, it has been showing up in our uh, ticketing system for me because the title gets cut off. So it just says, you'll do a history of marrying for reasons, which is kind of what the book uh, is about. Um, and so I'll just start Marsha with, how did you come to this topic and decide to explore it from the perspective you did? I assume some of it came out of your previous work. Definitely some was out of my previous work. My previous work was much uh, narrower. It was just on mail order marriage and some of the same reasons, right? A lot of Miller brides, it's very instrumental. A lot of them are marrying for immigration benefits, uh, a lot of economics going into that as well. So I needed to do that book before I could tackle something this big. But the general idea of marrying for reasons other than love comes from a story I tell in the introduction about, it's a family story. And it's one that's you know almost mythical in my family about my great aunt Rosie. And my great aunt Rosie in the 1930s, she's working in a factory on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. She's Jewish, all her friends are Jewish. Her best friend is Jewish. Many of them are recent immigrants. And her best friend's family is starting to get really, really worried because the Nazis are rising to power and they have a son, she has a brother who's still stuck in Poland and he can't get out. 
due to America's draconian immigration restrictions, quotas on Jews, no shot of coming over to this country. The one exception is marriage. So, you know, Rosie says, okay, I'll go over to Europe and I'll marry him and I'll bring him over. So in the late 1930s, she goes into, you know, Nazi occupied Europe to, you know, a single Jewish woman to marry this man and, you know, save his life. And it's a love story. They wind up falling in love. They have a child. They have lots of grandchildren. They stay together for the rest of their lives. And we tell it that way as this heroic story, as this love story. But it always sat with me as almost a horror story too, right? That if she hadn't done this, this man who should have qualified for asylum, should have been able to come to this country, wouldn't have been able to. And that story really is the impetus for the book that I wanted to explore so many different reasons that people marry that are not love-based and why they do it and what's pushing at them in that direction and, and sort of what we think about that. Is this a good use of marriage? Is this a problematic use of marriage? And, you know, spoiler alert, it's definitely both. <laughs> yeah, and one of the things that's really interesting and I think makes it a really readable book is that it, as we were discussing before, approaches this not chronologically but thematically what it does really effectively i think is you know each theme layers on top of the other so you kind of can put things together from chapter to chapter um and some of them were things that i was very much expecting to find and many of them were surprising but i think the biggest category were things that i had known about that all of a sudden i was looking at from a really different angle and i think one of the things in here that will be most fascinating to our audience and readers is, um, I'll just give chapter two's name, The Government Loves a Gold Digger. Uh, I wonder if you can can dig into the history of the gold digger and what you've sort of uncovered looking at the laws that, that emerged around that idea. Well, chapter two on The Government Loves a Gold Digger is, gold diggers are pejorative term, right? So it's weird to say that the government loves a gold digger. So what does that mean? What I'm saying is that the government is encouraging people to marry for monetary benefits, that the government is actually paying people to get married. So we say how much we hate people marrying for money. At least that's the, the public line that's given. Yet a lot of our policies are the exact opposite, that historically and today, we will actually pay you to marry. Sometimes it's things that a lot of people know about, tax breaks, um, other types of, you know, monetary benefits from the government, uh, you know, through deductions and um, things like that. And then sometimes it's literally a check. We will give you a check for getting married. Uh, so it's it's about the ways the government in, uh, encourages people to marry uh, instrumentally. And the purpose seems to be simply to get people to marry. Right. And I talk a lot about the different reasons why the government thinks marriage is good and why they want people to marry. But they're very the government has historically and today been very blatant that. Love is not really their concern. It's whatever we need to do to get people married, because we think marriage is so beneficial to our society. Yeah, it is almost it's almost a pathology that that it, it doesn't really matter. And there are so many ways you explore that, like. Once it's in a marriage, it's okay. Um, there's a really interesting set of family relations that you untangle where um, just thinking about the way that essentially race intersects with almost a coverture idea that, that your race can essentially socially change depending on the, the people you associate with and how you marry. I wonder if you can unpack a couple of those stories. Sure. Um, race and marriage is very, very interesting. And it's it, uh, the book talks about it from a number of different angles. Uh, Pre-Civil War, one of the things that marriage could do was it could actually change your racial categor categorization. Uh, if I, I live in South Carolina, we have a long history of this, uh, but for a number of different reasons, some okay and some horrible, you had mixed race individuals in this country, right? So people who skin color wise wasn't clear necessarily what race they were. So 
if racial categorization matters so much, we have to figure out a way to say who is white and who is black. Um, and for certain freed individuals, uh, one of the ways they could cement their status as white would be, as you said, to show acceptance by the white community. And the greatest fact you can point to for acceptance by the white community is marrying someone who is indisputably white. And I have a number of cases in which, um, you know, the mixed race individuals, their racial status is being challenged and their marriage to a white person is used as the definitive proof that they are white and therefore they get the privileges of being white. Even though in a lot of these cases, it's very, very clear. It, it's not that they don't, they're not sure. It's documented that uh, they are descended from, you know, a non-white person. In a few of the cases, they were even enslaved themselves, formerly enslaved themselves, and they can become white through marriage. Yeah, and I I know of situations where this has happened, where white families get a certain number of generations back in their own genealogical tracings and then stop because something something has has appeared that they're uncomfortable with and this sort of fluidity um of of racial categorization which is itself challenging because of census records and people can kind of move and all this but this explicit almost suspension of disbelief um within marriage was was a really fascinating thing one one of the chapters that I was really kind of intrigued by when you started was this idea of marrying for status, because I sort of, you know, I saw that and I was like, okay, I know what this is going to kind of mean. Um, but you explore a lot of different, a lot of different ways that status can manifest in marriage. And I wonder if you can talk about a few and what that means today. Sure. Uh, and I do talk, uh, that chapter was sort of, um, maybe one of the the least obvious uh, ones. So I have it as status and some of it's political status. Uh, historically, the way that women were supposed to have political power was through marriage. They were explicitly told things like, you don't need the vote because you'll influence your husband and your husband will vote for you. Then there was also actual social status, right? Married people had a higher social status than unmarried people. And sometimes it was more oh, you poor unmarried spinster thing, we feel sorry for you. And then sometimes it was actual fear. And a lot of that was gendered. So women, they tended to feel sorry for, but not threatened by if they were unmarried. Um, unmarried men in like the colonial period were seen as a very real threat. And one of the ways for men to show in the early, um, in early America that they were qualified for political power for wielding the vote was that they were married men, that they had a family, that they were responsible. So marriage was the way you created that status. And it also um, has racial components, right? That one of the ways you showed if you, uh, you were or like a recently freed um, African-American, that you were, that you were worthy of the vote and worthy of citizenship was if you conformed to the white marriage ideal, right? So you got married and you had a family and you were head of the household. So that was often one of the, the most accessible ways for black men to gain status in the 19th century. And I, uh, you know, it's, it's not as different today as either you might think, or you might hope. Uh, if you look at just, um, political power, so many of our female politicians come there through marriage. They're, uh, I think it was a third of the first female senators were uh, Senate widows, basically. Their husbands died in office. I have a quote in there about, you know, the best, I may, I may be quoting it slightly wrong, but the, the best way uh, to gain political power is to, you know, have basically a dead politician husband. Right. You can just come in and say, I am my husband's substitute and therefore I am un unthreatening. I know I'm, I'm a just woman. carrying on his work, his not work, my own. Worry, not getting uppity here, just doing his work. And that historically worked really, really well. And it still works really, really well. Um, and 
uh, a lot of, you know, our very powerful women have to tone it down. You'll see that in speeches. I, I quote a speech that uh, Justice Amy Coney Barrett gives when she is, uh, she's accepting, you know, her role in the Supreme Court. And her speech is all about being a homeroom parent. I mean, she's going to be one of the most powerful women in the country. And she feels the need to downplay it based on her role as a wife and mother. That way it's more palatable. So we still absolutely have uh, this role of marriage is making female power more, more acceptable in America. And then also this related, uh, the status that comes from marriage and the idea that married people are more worthy of certain things. Uh, one, I, I think it's in this chapter, one of the examples that I give that's often hard um, is that, uh, is related to medical care, that married people are given better medical care, better life-saving treatment often, based on the idea that their lives are more valuable. And that's just horrific, um, but also an indication that uh, we haven't moved beyond the idea of marriage as uh, indicating status and worthiness here. Yeah, I was not surprised to read about the economic benefits as an unmarried person. I'm very, very aware of, of just the tax benefits alone. But the thing that really struck me was um, the, the medical care, the, the increased likelihood that someone will get the death penalty if they are unmarried, the willingness to parole someone if they're married more, uh, all kinds of things. But then the way that that immediately rolls into, I, I was really struck, the, the framing, and, and I may be, may be mischaracterizing this, but that that lots of people choosing to stay in bad or at least not good marriages. I had assumed it was more, if it was about status, it was about the stigma of divorce. And you almost suggest that it's as much the stigma of being on, or the or the status loss of being unmarried again after you have been? I mean, I think that's what I was seeing. I have this, I have a lot of different sources in this book. And one of the fun things about this book for me is I, don't, I didn't need it to get tenure anymore, right? So I have, I have a billion footnotes. You can ignore them if you're not a footnote person, but it also meant that I could use a variety of sources, some of which included like Facebook posts, and there's this the, one the tone shift was incredible. And all of a sudden there'd be these social media comments from two years ago. It was great. Yeah, because, you know, you want to know what people, modern day people think about this. And there's this Facebook post to your point. You know, why do people, I think she says, why do women stay in shitty marriages um, when they don't have to, when they have the economic uh, ability to leave? Because we all know, yes, if you might stay in a marriage if you can't afford to leave. But if you can afford to leave, why would you stay in a bad marriage? And so many of the women responding were saying the status that comes with being married, that they're afraid to lose that. Even, you know, they might get married again someday, but just the idea of not being in the marriage status anymore. It's not about being divorced or the failed marriage. It's about not being married. So I, I think your understanding of it is mine as well. Yeah. And the, the way I, I will tell everyone, like, this book is worth reading simply for the way that the Obergefell decision is uh, implicated in many of these things, which are, are you know, the, was a commentary at the time um, around this decision. Um, but, but I had never really reflected on the way that the language of that decision uh, is, is really one of the purest modern distillations of the government sort of like, it doesn't matter what kind of marriage it is as long as it's a marriage. And you see that in all kinds of ways in this book, there's the desire to, to still have it be the right kind of marriage. And there's worries about advantage being taken. And then there's plenty of situations where it's like, whatever, as long as you're married, you could actually be married twice and we won't even really get so upset about it. I have a bunch of stories about bigamy and yes, historically between divorce and bigamy, the government was absolutely on the side of bigamy. If they had to choose, just keep marrying. <laughs> that, that was better. <laughs> Two marriages, and I'm given given the forces that are getting people into marriage, the the sort of betrayal of bigamy is less. It's less of a sting, you know. You sort of see that, and and this is sort of some of the other stories, including some family stories that you raise in here, 
um, that made me think about there's a domestic servant who works in the Clemens house. And the sort of story that we know is that that she has a gentleman friend over and and she is caught and all this kind of stuff. And when you are living as a servant in a home, the people who run that home effectively get to tell you what to do. And it's the sort of like, oh, Lizzie, then she goes and marries this man. And it's always sat wrong with me um, that that there are so many lines where if it is crossed, not only does marriage, it's not just that marriage saves you socially, it's that you marriage gets you out of punishments, including some for some truly horrific behavior. Um, and there's lots of kind of like silly, almost farcical behavior in here. And then there is some truly atrocious behavior in here that the government is willing to condone because you know what, at the end of the day, it's a marriage. So one of the chapters that I think people are, or the chapter that people are maybe most surprised about, but also can be the hardest to read is the one about marrying for criminal defense, yeah. right? If we have such a hearts in our eyes idea about love that the idea that you would marry to commit a crime is so antithetical to that idea that we really have a hard time wrapping our head around it. But historically and today, that is still one of the benefits of marriage and it's a benefit of marriage that people continue to use. So, you know, some of the historic crimes that I talk about are not crimes today, uh, things like seduction and breach of promise to marry. That sounds more like the Clemens House case, potentially, mm -hmm. right? He seduces her and then you could, I mean, she might've been willing, uh, you know, I, I talk about the difference between seduction and rape back in the 19th century, like fine line that maybe didn't exist, uh, but, it was about having sex with an unmarried woman. You've ruined her that way. That was criminal, but you could avoid jail if you marry her. Um, then, you know, the, the the harm though was actually supposed to be her father because he's now now she's ruined and he's got to take care of her forever. Mm -hmm. Breach of promise to marry, right? You, you propose and then you break it off. And then again, the woman's considered ruined because there must be something wrong with her if you didn't go through with it and now no one else will marry her. And what else? is a woman's purpose in life if not to get married. So you've hurt her economically in all sorts of ways. We don't have those crimes anymore. We have variations a little bit. I always teach my students about uh, about their engagement rings. So I have law students, they're all in their twenties. They all seem to be engaged. That's the class they like best because they all wanna know if the engagement uh, fails, who gets to keep the ring? Who gets the ring, yeah. Who keeps the ring? And that's still related to breach of promise to marry. Uh, but on the whole, we don't have those. But some of the other criminal benefits of marriage are things like, you know, uh, statutory rape, domestic violence. Uh, these, uh, there is a long history that we continue to have that we we believe in this idea of marital harmony and marital sanctity to the extent that we're willing to overlook a lot of crimes that are that occur within a marriage. So crimes that occurred outside of a marriage, you would be punished severely for, but if it's within a marriage, we say, oh, we're gonna pull the curtains around this family and let them work it out. Um, and you know, not only did these ideas exist, you know, well, you know, through the 20th century, but even today, uh, though we punish domestic violence and we'll punish marital rape, the penalties are not the same. The standard of proof is not the same, which gives, not just the impression, but I think, you know, shows that we don't view it as bad if it happens in a marriage. And I'm, there's certainly an argument that's way worse in a marriage, right? This is someone who's supposed to love you, um, who you're supposed to trust. And one of the other examples I give has to do with statutory rape. Uh, if you want to sleep with children, best way to do that in this country is to marry them. And that's completely legal. And there's a big push to raise the age of consent so that you cannot marry children. There's still a push somewhat in the other direction too. And, you know, states are not that quick to eliminate this. And there are a bunch of states, particularly with pregnancy, that they want that to be an exception. And now after the Dobbs case, um, mm -hmm. I have a line in the book. Uh, I haven't thought yeah. that much about it, but I could see if you have sex with a child and she gets pregnant and she can't abort, well, that's evidence of your crime. If you marry her, that might be your way of staying out of prison. Yeah, that is was one of my first thoughts, coherent thoughts after the Dobbs decision was 
that the number of crimes that were now going to be visible in a new way um, because of this was going to be greater. Um, and I think it's interesting because it's it's not technically different. The breach of promise, you can, you know, marry someone and that goes away. That seems sort of like, okay, well, you tried to welch on this deal. But the idea that, that you can expunge statutory rape, a crime that you committed effectively by marrying. Um, and I, I sort of wondered because I was thinking about the connection between the the worry about unmarried men in the colonial period and, and even into sort of the early 19th century with sort of like young men in the cities, what are they doing? Um, and and the idea that, that domestic violence would somehow go away within a, that marriage would settle a man down and this wouldn't happen anymore, which honestly to me in a book full of a whole lot of magical thinking, struck me as the one where I was like, oh, everyone involved knows this is a fiction. But that it's but that it's more important for a marriage to exist to kind of cover over these these crimes. Um, were there times when you were just like, I I don't believe anyone saying these things believed what they were saying? No, I actually think a lot you of think they did? Do. Yeah. I mean not to the full extent, but do I think a lot of people think marriage settles men? Not that yeah. there will be no domestic violence anymore, but do they think that that's a good way of taming the wildness out of? And yes, sometimes there'll be domestic, but but that's sort of the 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 price for the benefit. Yeah. Um, well, that 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 someone that that sort of is a role for women to to absorb that for the benefit, so that men can go and be productive and I know that's the way we talk about men's sexual incontinence in in the past as well but that that oh, it benefits society for men to be tamed to whatever extent they can be tamed I mean when you look at like the incel movement there are you know it, yeah. it's based on the idea that these are men who want to be able to have their version of a relationship with women and the women are rejecting them but in their minds and I think some people believe it that if they could be in a relationship right then um then their violent tendencies would be yeah. lessened they it's not that they wouldn't commit domestic violence but maybe they wouldn't be like a danger to society at large society. yeah um and you know that's a lot of our, our choice with marriage here that we think marriage is a beneficial institution for our society and it might be beneficial to the individuals but even if it's not beneficial to the individuals, we still might promote it if we think it's beneficial to society in general. So I, I, I feel like it can be both sides of both coins. Uh, some of the things we do with marriage or ways you can use marriage instrumentally might help the individuals in that marriage. But I think it is bad for society. An example, you know, um, like immigration, right? I, I think that's I, you know, using marriage to bring someone over, of course, you should do that. If that's the only way to save their life, do it. But I think it's a problem that our immigration system preferences marriage over uh, over asylum in a case like that. You know, th th that's a problem. Yeah. Or uh, you benefit the institution of marriage because you think that it helps economically, it helps socially, it helps, you know, in general, even though some of the women and men who are doing the work in these marriages are not being benefited um, to the same extent. So I think it yeah. goes both ways. Yeah, and it did make me sort of think, you know, that that we all say, like, oh, I would I would do that to save somebody's life. But given the framework and the possibility and the non-possibility of divorce in, I mean, it's it's really important to think about this stuff outside of the frame of no-fault divorce, which of course you go into in the book and go into the way that it is actively being targeted for elimination in lots of places. But it did make me think about, okay, but, but what would it actually mean? What would I be committing to, to say I'm going to marry this person? And in your case, it has the sort of happy ending. But, you know, this, this ancestor of yours had, I mean, we can't underplay what this person did and what this person potentially gave 
up and the danger they put themselves in because they don't know who this person is. And the idea that like, it, it reminded me of those things where it's sort of like those, those stories that are framed as heartwarming stories. And it's like, oh no, that's because we have a bad economy where nobody can retire. That, that it was both heartwarming and like, it made me wonder how many other stories there were where they were really, you know, either either someone loses out on the love that they did have for somebody else or they end up in this in this terrible situation. So so many of the stories in here are really excellent at exposing um, you know, marriage as a solution to problems that have been created or won't be fixed by the government. And that you I, I pulled a line out that like the framing of thinking about women's economic status and, and the actual control they could have over their own wages and lines of credit and all these things, rather than thinking about women as sort of looking to marry wealthy men or looking to marry even stable men as a way to get rich. You said they are looking at looking for these things, quote, as a way to avoid being poor, that, that, that these are, instead of only talking about Although you do a really wonderful job of thinking about people like Anna Nicole Smith, like thinking about the realities of particularly unmarried women and poverty and the ways I know that they were sort of slipped through the cracks of the New Deal in particular, that the assumption was someone else would take care of them. Um, and I wonder if there's a story in here of of kind of a unique use of marriage in a really pragmatic way that struck you. Well, I think it, less a story, but one of the studies that really uh, stands out to me is the one where, now I, I think it was Wisconsin, but they decide, the government decides for a different reason, that they're going to let these women on welfare keep the full amount of the payment. They, they otherwise, they were taking out um, like child support payments or so, some something that they were taking out. So now the women were going to have more money. Um, and this was for other reasons, but one of the things they found was that these women, when they just had that little bit more money, they stopped, uh, the marriage rates didn't change, but they stopped cohabiting with bad guys. So it became very clear mm -hmm. that they were living with these men that they had no interest in marrying and they wouldn't marry them because they knew they were not good partners. They weren't safe. They weren't uh, safe in a lot of different ways, maybe physically, economically. And as soon as they just had a little bit of money, they, they didn't want to rely on men for money, right? They were doing it as a last ditch effort and in relationships that they themselves thought were unattractive, dangerous, problematic. Uh, so it didn't change the marriage rates. Women who did find the good guy, the marriageable guy, were still getting married, even if they had more money, but they weren't desperately relying on these dangerous situations and that mm -hmm. one has always struck me very much that you know when we're when we're judging women for marrying for money i don't think most women want to it's that these other things are uh impelling relying on you know, it's, it's usually gendered relying on a man for economic security and that's the problem not the individual women who do that i don't judge them for that if that's your best way of surviving then you should do it but that says something more wrong with our society i think than that they're not you know marrying for love and being you know poor together yeah, and I think some of the really, the book does a really good job. If we're talking about things where you're sort of like, well, I didn't know things were like that, and I don't know when these things changed, you do a really good job of sort of um, undergirding this discussion with how kind of laws and social mores about women's property ownership, married and unmarried, change throughout this whole period, um, which I think is really useful because even I had sort of forgotten these moments of um, of slippage. But one of the really interesting discussions is the way, particularly in the early 20th century, sort of feminists are torn over sort of gendered legal protections um, that as the, as the situation stands, protect women. And the concern is by carving out this special um, sort of legal privilege for them, are you sort of perpetuating their inequality in society. And I don't know if you can talk a bit about what they, 
what they hoped and dreamed would happen in the future? Well, uh, let me talk about it this way. So I teach family law. I teach an advanced family law class, a reproductive rights class, and the majority of my students are female. And that is not because women are the majority of people who have families, right? And it's seen as a woman's issue. It's something that women care about. Um, and this is problematic in certain ways, but it also creates power, right? That um, historically, when women were advocating for things that were seen as women's issues, they were listened to. So I talk about the maternalist feminist movement. And when women were seeking reforms as mothers, they were very, very powerful. But then if you also uh, what sort of limit women's power to their roles as wives and mothers, then they're only going to be powerful in this very narrow way. But they were very successful in seeking those reforms. So that was a lot of the, the, the I don't know, the, the, the concern, you know, do we keep doing what we're very successful at? Or do we try to move into something there's going to be a lot of pushback and then maybe we don't have, then we lose the power that we currently have. And I mean, it, it's still there. Like I said, you know, the, the, the topics that I teach are seen as women's topics and they shouldn't be. Um, but the flip side of that is that women may have more power in these areas. Yeah. And, and I think people may be surprised at how, recently and blatantly the government uses benefits programs to not only encourage marriage, but to encourage uh, women who are married not to be in the workforce. So I wonder if you could talk like these were some wrinkles that I knew about this program, but but I had no idea how blatant some of the SS uh, at that time, just Social Security Act uh, later provisions were. Yeah, I mean, Social Security and tax Right. I mean, the 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 marriage penalty uh, that you hear about, um, you know, that's for equal income earners. So if both of you are making about the same, then getting married puts you worse off tax wise. If one of you is making a lot more than the other one, then it's a big tax benefit. So we were benefiting the traditional, you know, one wage earner and the non wage earner, lower wage earner. Um, and then also for the lower one, the tax that they're now going to be paying on their lower salary often means it doesn't make sense to work. So we're incentivizing women to drop out of the workforce potentially to take care of their kids. You really see this when you start looking at the price of childcare, right? You're yep. like, well, I'm basically paying to work. So you drop out and maybe this is okay. Maybe it's not, but it's a real problem when, uh, when the marriage doesn't last. And then all of a sudden you've been out of the workforce for 20 years, you're not really employable anymore, your spouse has a very high income, you know, maybe they're going to be paying you alimony, but a lot of states are moving away from alimony. Uh, you know, one of the things, the decisions you make when you're a family and planning to be a family forever are different than the decisions you would make if you think you might get divorced one day. Yeah. So, <laughs> One of the other things that my students are always shocked about, I read, I have it in the book, but I read this letter written by a 19th century woman who, you know, she's been raising the kids, taking care of the farm. She's been working for like 50 years uh, and she wants to go to the, uh, the women's rights convention. And her husband's like, we have no money for that foolishness. And she pens this letter saying all the things she's done for him, all the work she's done, and that she's shocked to find out that she has no money. She can't make him give her the money that the only thing she owns is this pen that she's writing with signed pen holder. And she owns the pen because it was a gift from her brother. So that is from her brother. property she has. And I, ha I read that uh, letter to my students and then I ask them, would it be any different today? And all of them go, of course. And then I look at them and I pause and they realize <laughs> I'm very obvious with the pause. They're like, what? Like, what do you mean? I'm like, no, like, you could get divorced and then you have a right to something like 50% of the property. But during the marriage, if you're not the one earning it, you can't access that bank account if they haven't given you access to it. And that is shocking to my 21st century students. And it should be. Yeah. And, and I think one of the things that the book does really well is it 
and because I think your students are thinking about this, thinking about what are the things of value and the things of benefit within a relationship. And I remember like, I remember as a child on a sick day, seeing an episode of Dr. Phil. And it was a very classic case of she's spending all my money. And like, he's a big disaster and a problem in a lot of ways. But he made that husband write down how much he would have to pay someone to do all of the things that his wife did. And the sort of the question of less about income and more about value added to the relationship was really driven home for me there. I think one thing, and, and people may be familiar with this, but you talk about, you know, marriage penalty, equal earners, you have an interesting section on the issue of status in a marriage, um, in a heterosexual marriage where the husband earns less than the wife. I wondered if you could talk about that a bit. Yeah. Um, so what I'm talking about in that section is the, the, so your typical uh, leave it to beaver family, right? The man earns the money and the woman doesn't, or she has, you know, a lower paying job that she then leaves. You know, the, the stereotype of the doctor who marries his nurse, um, the boss who marries his secretary. It just, you know, sometimes we, we laugh at those a little bit, but like the men didn't lose status for marrying the- Marrying below. Lower earning, yeah, the lower status woman, um, you know, she lower status and she earns less often had less education, that was fine. That was in some ways, it, it actually status increasing. Oh, I make enough money to support a wife or, um, you know, I can, I make enough money to go after looks more than anything else. Uh, and it could be, it was, it was status increasing for the women as well. I'm marrying this high powered doctor, this high powered CEO, whatever that raises my status. Um, but the opposite historically has not been true at all. Right. That uh, men feel that if their wives are making more money than them, it's status lowering. Uh, there are lots of studies about how the men will discount this money, how the women have women actually when they when the women are making more money, uh, they have to do more housework, which is so counterintuitive. Right. Like in the leave it to beaver. Fine. He makes the money and she uh, she does the housework and all that. But because it's status lowering for men, uh, they actually will refuse They'll do less housework to reassert that they are manly. So the woman is doing the majority of the money earning work. And then she has to come home and do the second shift and take care of, you know, all the house stuff as well as the kids. Yeah. I mean, there were so many, the status chapter was honestly the one that, that I really fascinated me because I think it got, perhaps it was the one that was the most focused on just the weird anxieties, the, the imagined things around this status. Um, and just another really excellent way to drive home to anyone in the economics department, like the idea of rational economic actors, that, that, that these men are not that. In fact, the women who are making choices when given slightly more, more of the money, of the, the entitlements money or the welfare money, like those are rational economic choices in these in these sorts of spots. Um, yeah, there were, I, I wanna bring up Sam Clemens and sort of talk a bit about um, his his marriage to, to Livia Langdon, um, a situation where um, he, is, he is an up and coming author, um, seen as a stable profession just as much in the 19th century as it is now. And she is, um, uh, an eligible daughter of a very wealthy family, um, that, that it's her money that builds this house, that um, he, he becomes a, a high earner in many ways, but her money provides that initial stability. And I wondered, given what you've sort of looked at in this book, um, what sorts of comments or thoughts would you imagine were made about that marriage at the time? I know he had to get references and he didn't even pick good people. Some of his friends were like, why didn't you ask me? No one's going to, this person didn't even give you a good reference. I mean, I, I don't know what my thoughts are exactly. <laughs> uh, I'm not surprised as in like, this is what people do. Marrying for money makes a lot of sense. If you're a potentially not economically stable writer, marrying someone with a lot of money, great. Like a, a lot writer. of, people, you know, you don't, I, uh, I, I've written books but I have a day job. 
<laughs> because I can't, you know, support myself on my writing. Um, yeah. I didn't marry to do this, but it, you know, that's another option. Yeah. Uh, and I, I don't mean to say in any way that Sam didn't also love his wife, but I don't think he hated that she came from money either. I mean, I have a lot of quotes about, you know, it's just as easy to fall in love with a rich person as a poor person. Yeah. And that's what I guess he did, right? Like if you mm -hmm. limit who you might marry to only rich people, then you pick the one that you like the best. Yeah. And, and that you're able to do it because of the way things sort of, because of all the other dimensions of power and, and that exist legally in these, in these kinds of spaces. Um, the fact that the Clemenses move out of their home because, because Sam loses most of the money they have on, on doing a bunch of things that are theoretically smart, but don't work. Um, is sort of a really difficult bookend of their time in the home. Um, and I found this this book is gonna go into the into the guide room tomorrow to, to be explored by people. Because there are so many places where the stories that we tell in the museum um, about the Clemens family, about the domestic servants uh, who are unmarried, who become married, who are married but live apart from their spouse, um, uh, you know, who married coming out of enslavement, all kinds of things. Um, it, it's fascinating because, you know, we think about the family as the little commonwealth and it's this way to explore so many aspects of society. And I, I, I was, I mean, this, this book reminded me of, of wonderful books like Peggy Pascoe, all of these great things where you look at the law and the stories behind the law and you learn so much about human behavior. And I wonder just as my last question, so people in the chat, I know you've left lots of questions, we'll get to those. How did you approach, you're obviously a, a scholar of, of the law and legal history. How did you think about the law and getting at the lived experience behind it when kind of tackling this question? Well, I think what I'm doing a lot of is how, how does the law influence people's decisions even if they some of them are aware that the law is doing that, right? That they they know what the law is and mm -hmm. they are marrying to get a legal benefit. But a lot of the stories I have in here are people being influenced in their marriages and the relationships by the law in ways that they're not fully cognizant of. And I feel like, you know, maybe as a legal scholar, that's something that I can bring to the table that others maybe can't. Um, I can look at some of these historical stories and say it's the law doing this, and then I can, you know, find case law from it. But it's not. Uh, I, I didn't necessarily start with cases. Some mm -hmm. in some instances I did, but that wasn't. I started with I don't know types of marriages, mm -hmm. and how does the law influence people into making these types of marriages? And like I said, sometimes the parties know that they're being influenced by law and policy and other times they don't, but I'm trying to expose that as the background uh, noise that's going on there that explains something that we might describe as one way. And I'm saying, well, we may say this is about love or respect or whatever, but it's it might not have occurred if we didn't also have these legal incentives behind it. Mm -hmm. And then you see, I think some of the interesting moments are when the composition of the country or the size or the shape, all kinds of things change and, and the law being reactive to those shifts. And I think like if there's one through line, which you said at the beginning, it is the state has an interest in people being married. And that in almost every case, when there is a legal shift or a reaction or a sound legal decision or a contorted legal decision, it is to kind of maintain that through line of any marriage is better than than no marriage. Um, I mean, you brought up a Burgerfell before, and yep. I mean, a Burgerfell on one hand is a great decision, I believe, strongly in marriage equality, but it also re entrenched marriage as mm -hmm. the central defining uh, or the central way we define our families, and it didn't have to. It was a moment in which we could have. I don't know, broken open marriage and decided to do something different. And instead we said, we're just going to, you know, expand the marriage tent and it, more people can get married now, but the family structure we want is marriage. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's good and bad. 
Yeah. And, and the, I did not know. I mean, I, I suppose maybe I did know, but I didn't really know until I saw it in black and white. I just opened up to the page uh, on, on that case that, that marital status itself is not a protected class in any way. And that there are stories in here where uh, a woman being denied fertility treatment, ultimately uh, it, w it wasn't in any way, she, could, she couldn't essentially sue that she was denied this as an unmarried lesbian potential mother. It was, it was that, that she was gay was the reason that there could be discrimination, but not that she was unmarried and that landlords can, can and prefer couples to um, to singletons and things like this. So um, it, it's just a, such a rich and and readable book, um, and I think very well framed in the sense that that there is no sort of judgment about why people are in marriage. If there's any judgment in here, it's reserved for people who would make historical claims about marriage that are not. Um, but rooted in evidence in any way. Um, so I think Omar dropped the, um, the, the link in the chat, but uh, this, it's such a good read. And I think um, really packed with lots of stories that will make you think. Um, I was doing an awful lot of photographing pages and texting them to people as I was reading it. Um, so that's to me a good sign. Um, so I will get to some of the questions in here. Glad to see some of our faves um, and, and frequent commenters in here. Um, so I'll, I'll go with Stuart, which was the first one. You know, yesterday versus today, you can define this how you want. Who benefits most from marriage? Uh, in this case, heterosexual marriage, the man, the woman, or society? I think it depends. I mean, it's a great question, but I don't think I have an answer because I think it does depend on the marriage. Um, mm -hmm. In the book, I talk about cases in which it's the man who benefits, in which it's the woman who benefits, in which it's society. And sometimes it's all three. Um, and sometimes it's only one and it's, only a little bit. It's nobody. Yeah, so, well, if somebody always gets something. Benefits. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because, yeah, if there's really, if there's no benefit in the marriage at all, yeah. then people tend not to do it. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't have to be that big a benefit. So I don't know that I can generalize and say it's more one than the other, but all of them are potential beneficiaries depending on uh, their circumstances and what they're marrying for. Yeah, this that reminded me of another like character type that is in here. The man who just straight up lies about what he is as a, as a job and how much money he has. And then he marries a woman and she's like, you are skint. We have nothing. Um, that, that, that happens a lot in here. And, and the ability to, to, it made me sort of think about like how much you cannot know about the person that you marry even now. But like back then, how would a woman have found out how much money her, her potential husband had? No, you can't. And I mean, I have a lot of stuff in here about love as this sort of smokescreen often used to deny women rights. Mm -hmm. And if you're supposed to marry for love, then the fact that he's broke shouldn't bother you, right? Because you're not supposed to be marrying him for money anyway. And, you know, it was just so disingenuous because they're saying this at a time where, you know, women can't make any money. And if you marry a man who has no money, like you're in financial trouble. And mm -hmm. the course just like, you know, it's fine. Um, and this is also at a time when people couldn't get divorced. Now you can get divorced, but lying about your financial situation, the courts are not sympathetic towards that. That's not a grounds for divorce. You yeah. can get a no fault divorce for whatever reason. For the moment, there's a big push against that. If we go back to fault based divorce, then you're stuck in that marriage. The fact that they lied to you, there are only a very small number of things that people can lie to you about that the courts will let you out of the marriage for. Yeah. Um, and that, that you love him, so you should still marry him. He loves you. That's why he can shoot your lover and get and get away with it. Yeah, the, the heat of passion defense. So there's I all kinds of things. Uh, yeah. Um, so let's see. So Anna was asking, do you think that purity culture in the U.S. still greatly affects why people get married? That's a good question. And I'm not sure one that I've thought about a lot. I think 
So the one category of, of marriage that I don't talk about are religious marriages. So I look at marrying for reasons other than love, but I specifically don't look at religion. And I think religion is its own category. I'm not a religion scholar, but uh, even if we got rid of all of these other benefits that I talk about, religious people would still get married. Marriage is a sac sacrament, it's a commandment. Um, and then within many religions, you're not supposed to have sex before marriage. So I think some of the purity stuff comes into that. Historically, absolutely. Um, some of the reason why we had these criminal punishments was because a, a woman's purity was so important and that, uh, you know, if, if she was no longer a virgin, she was ruined. Uh, I also have um, some of the stories about how like impure women couldn't testify about anything because, you know, you can't trust them, but an impure man, that's fine. We can still trust him. So, you know, there's some of that running through the book, but I do think a lot of it, uh, is connected to religion, which I don't explore as much. Yeah. Uh, and then we'll do one more. Um, Candy asks, did you find examples of lavender marriages that did not include famous people? And I know there are some examples in here uh, that I, you know, are slightly more famous. That, that did not include famous people? Well, yeah. You know, did we, did we find ones that are just Joe Schmo? Um, by lavender, the same sex marriage? I uh, assume... Sorry. I yeah, I assume that's what we're talking about here. Uh well, I mean, I, I talk about the Obergefell case a lot. I guess they're famous now, but you know, they're they're regular people. Um, I talk a lot about marriage within the same sex community and the debate uh, about whether or not you know they wanted marriage. On the you know, a lot of people wanted marriage, but a lot of people thought like, hey, one of the great things about us is that we're not stuck in this, you know, this archaic heteronormative institution that has all of these problems, we can create our own thing. And Obergefell kind of ended that. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I'm guessing that you were a little more able to find situations where, uh, where a gay man sort of married a woman for um, social protection and things like this. I'm guessing those sorts of marriages are harder to find than one like the story of your ancestor, where the immigration process makes it really clear kind of what the benefit was here that you might have tagged that marriage even if it hadn't been someone in your family but when it's when it's cases of sort of companion marriage for social protection it might be harder to suss it out i mean i it's something i actually wanted to write about a little bit more but the sort of beard marriages mm -hmm. are harder to know yeah what, what they are necessarily and i i think i have uh, one, the, I think the former New Jersey governor uh, was in a marriage like that. And I think I cite him in one of the footnotes, but it was very hard to, it goes into the social status and the power, right? Mm -hmm. So if you wanted political power as a man, you needed to be married to a woman. So even being single wasn't good enough. So it wasn't, you know, if you were a gay man, you couldn't just not get married and have the same sort of political power you could that if you got married. So I don't have really examples where I can say, this is a gay man who did it for this reason. Mm -hmm. um, but given that power was, that status were so connected to marriage, I have to assume lots and lots of them did that because they were politically ambitious and that's what you needed to do. Yeah, there's a reason I think we've only had one president who wasn't married when he was elected, and then he got married in a way that is a little unsettling to some of us, given the the large age gap. Um, so I think, Marcia, you sort of say at the beginning of the book that like lots of people will see themselves in different parts of this book in in expected and unexpected ways. Um, I think it's uh, I was I was expecting to really enjoy it, and it. Uh, it kind of surpassed those expectations in how much it made me think about different aspects of um, of how we sort of move through the world. Like it's made me reconsider and think a lot about relationships I know and, and um, the government's interest in marriage, which is frankly a little creepy in here at times. It's like, back off. You're more into this than either of the people in the marriage. Um, so uh, I, I will say again, I think Omar put the link in the chat. If you, if you are interested in the book, get it from the museum store. Um, 
and then when you're done reading it, um, share it with your friends, uh, recommend it to, to everybody. I'm seeing lots of people being like, Mallory, our curator was like, I can't wait to read it. I was talking to her today about this. Like there are so many connections, you have to read this. Um, and I think Omar has also mentioned in the chat, um, upcoming events this Friday, I'll be talking to Ralph Young about a history of dissent in America. Um, and there were, there were weird connections between the two books and I was trying to keep them apart in my mind. Um, so join us for that. I think we have some upcoming in-person uh, author talks and join us in a few weeks for our Language of Flowers Valentine crafts. Again, craft um, the nicest or the rudest message you can out of flowers. Um, so that'll be a fun time. So thank you again, Marsha. And thanks everybody for joining us. Hope everybody's power stays on tonight. Thank you so much. Thanks.